Here we go. Sunday before Christmas, I always do a Christmas message, and it's been a while since I just kind of gone to the old standby, we would call it, and in Luke chapter 2, I'm going to read some verses to you, and we'll, we'll just kind of pull them apart, just a couple verses, and uh, as we do that, I want to caution you, I got that in here, but I'll caution you before I read it. What we tend to do as human beings is we, if we listen to something that we think we already know, we zone out. We go, oh, I know that. I know all about that story. But if you do that, then you never have any opportunity to learn anything different and see something in a different way or see something from a different angle because that's our natural thing. Oh, I know that, so I'm just done. I mean, like I already gotten in here, we read this story for years. Every Christmas Eve, we'd read this text, and then Mary Catherine would get to open a gift, which was usually a new pair of pajamas that she put on that night, and kind of got anticlimactic as you got older, because like, yeah, what kind of pajamas do I got this year? But, you know, and then, you know, we just move on and enjoy Christmas, but we started doing that to remind us what Christmas was about, it's about the birth of Christ, but not only that, to um, instill in us that truth of what this is about. So that's what I mean. We can zone out because if I was to read this in the King James, because that's what we used to read it out, I could recite it to you because we read it so much. And, just be, and you're going to probably hear me pause and stop because that's what my head's trying to do because I, I've read it so much and probably get it memorized. I'm reading it in a different translation this morning, so that's why I stutter and stammer sometimes, because my brain is trying to just repeat what I've known for years. So again, I just want to caution you in that. Don't zone out. Let's just pray and say, Lord, what do you want me to learn today? What do you want me to see different today in this text? So in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8, it says, that night, in the field near Bethlehem, shepherds were watching over their flocks. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared in radiant splendor before them, lighting up the field with the blazing glory of God, and the shepherds were terrified. But the angel reassured them, saying, Don't be afraid, for I have come to bring you good news, the most joyous news the world has ever heard. And it is for everyone everywhere. For today in Bethlehem, a rescuer was born to you. He is the Lord Yahweh, the Messiah. You will recognize him by this miraculous sign. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. No, see, it doesn't even say that. You'll find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth. That's because I got distracted. I looked over there and just kept talking. <laughs> lying in a feeding trough. Then all at once, in the night sky, a vast number of glorious angels appeared, a very heaven, the, the very heaven, the very armies of heaven. And they all praise God, singing glory to God in the highest realms of heaven. For there is peace and good hope given to the sons of men. When the chorus of angels disappeared and returned to heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let's go, let's hurry and find this word who is born in Bethlehem and see for ourselves what the Lord has revealed to us. So they hurried off and found their way to Mary and Joseph. And there was a the baby laying in a feeding trough. Upon seeing this miraculous sign, the shepherds recounted what had happened Everyone who heard the shepherd's story was astonished by what they were told. Then verse 19, but Mary treasured all these things in her heart and pondered what they meant. So again, we want to not just zone out. We want to grasp something new. Honestly, ask God, God, what new can I get out of this? Because I'll be honest with you, one of the hardest things for me to ever preach is Easter and Christmas. Because how many times can you preach the birth of Christ and the resurrection of Christ? Because I've been doing this for decades. 
How much can you say? It, it is what it is. And it's not like you want to put a new spin on it, but you know what? I want a new revelation. I want a new understanding. It's like, God, what can I take away from this story this morning as we go over it? So next slide, if you would. So let's look at verse 10. The message from the angel to the shepherd. Now notice the first thing he said, and you can follow along in the notes or on the website. He said, don't be afraid. Now again, put yourselves in those shepherd's shoes. Here you are, you're out in the field, tending the sheep. And no, it probably wasn't December 25th either, but who cares? They're out there at night, and there ain't no street lights. It's pretty dark, they got a fire going. You got a fire going in that one? Probably. And they're hanging out, and all of a sudden, this light being shows up out of nowhere. You're going to freak out. People would freak out if an angel were to show up right now. People freak out when, when you say, hey, I, I saw an angel, I talked with an angel, I sense the angels here. People freak out at that, but imagine being them. This guy literally showed up glowing bright and lighting up the whole field. So the first thing he's going to say is, it's obvious, don't be afraid. But think about this a minute, a little bit. Let's go a little bit deeper. Why don't be afraid? Because it would be natural to be afraid, but fear will mess with your natural senses. When you become afraid, you tend to think emotionally rather than logically, which will cause you to make irrational decisions. And the enemy knows that. He wants to bring fear into your life so you'll make irrational decisions, emotional decisions. How many people, especially through all this, you know, COVID stuff we've been going through. How many people have been putting on masks because they're afraid? How many people are getting this thing because they're afraid? Or feel coerced or whatever, that they're afraid. Fear is a great natural motivator, isn't it? And the devil knows that, and the devil's going to use fear whenever he can to motivate you to do what he wants you to do. Because fear, you can manipulate people, control people, deceive them. It's a tool the enemy to manipulate you into doing what he wants you to do. That's why it says in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God will never give us a spirit of fear. If fear comes upon your life, it's not from God. It's from the enemy, from the devil. He says, but the Holy Spirit will give us mighty power, love, and self-control. Because fear is designed to cause you to lose self-control so that you may be controlled by another. That's what happens. You know what? If you don't get this thing, we're going to fire you. Put you in fear. What's it to do? To control you into doing what they want you to do. <laughs> to take away your free choice. Now on a side note, Parents, I can say grandparents too, because we're that too. Never use this as a means to control in order to get your kids to behave. Don't, don't use the same method the devil does to control, because what you're doing is you're using a tool of the enemy, training your kids to be manipulated by fear, which will cause them grief and turmoil as adults. See, what parents do is create fear in the kids to make them behave. We got examples of it this week when Robin went and got tires. There were two kids going mental at the tire place. And she threatened him with what? Santa ain't coming and all kinds of stuff. Then the police are going to come and get you. And, you know, and my stepson's a police officer. And he literally had a confrontation with a guy who... Correct me if I don't get the story right. The kid was acting up. He wouldn't put his coat on or whatever. And went to my stepson and said, tell him to put his coat on or you're going to take him to jail. And he looked at him and says, no, I'm not going to do that. We want kids to know that we're safe people. And if they're in trouble, they can come to us. Not create fear over us. But see, that's what we do. We... We get naturally programmed this way because it works. 
But we've got to understand it's a tool of the devil. God has never given us a spirit of fear. So anytime you're being manipulated by fear or instilled with fear, it's coming from the devil and you need to stop it right there. So that's what, what the angel is doing. He's saying, look, at, I know you have a natural tendency to fear. All of a sudden, I show up. I'm bright as all get out. I'm lighting up everything around you. You've probably never seen anything like me, but don't fear. And then he goes on and says this, for I've come to bring you good news. See, the message of Christ being born is good news. The message of the gospel is good news. The message of faith is good news. So many people want to take the word of God and turn it into bad news. This is good news. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be adopted into the family of God. In a world that's constantly declaring bad news, it is refreshing to know we have a source that only declares good news. Why? Because God is absolutely good. Everything he says is good. Even the hard stuff is good. It's good for you. So we want to take what the Word of God says and instill it in our life, understanding he only has good thoughts and good things for us. That's why the angel said that. I come to bring you good news. And we need to be a purveyor of good news. You know, in, in the messes that are going on, there's good news. There's hope. Well, I don't see any. Well, the hope is in Jesus. The peace is in Jesus. The good news is in Jesus. The good news is in the Word of God. It is the source of all good news. Yeah, but that says some hard stuff. No, it's good news. See, what we've done is we've perverted it for our own understanding and our own feelings and our own senses. <sighs> One thing that really concerns me is the, the desensitizing the world is doing when it comes towards sin, and especially in the church. Especially when it comes with abortion. Killing babies. It's... It's hard when we don't, we've allowed society, is where I'm going with this, to desensitize us. So when we look at the Word of God and we see what the world is saying, we, we battle back and forth and we kind of weigh it out that way instead of just saying, no, God, you're good. Your Word is true. Your Word is honorable. Because what the world wants you to do is get into a feeling place. You can't argue with someone over feelings. You know, I went through that last week with, Town stuff again. You know, going through the budget. Somebody says, well, I feel we ought to cut this much out of here. I don't think we need da-da-da-da-da. And I finally get to the point and say, when you're dealing with a budget, you're dealing with facts and figures, not feelings and what you think is good or not good. Okay, if you want to cut this, did you actually like go to the department head, talk with them and see if they actually need it or not? Or you just sit back and say, hey, we're a little town. We don't need you know, another police officer, or we don't need another piece of apparatus, or we don't need, how do you know we don't need? Well, I don't think so. <laughs> and that's how a lot of the world functions. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with abortion. I don't think there's anything wrong with homosexuality. It's just two people who love each other. And see, when you, bring, when you bring that stuff into the feeling realm, then absolutes go out the door because it all depends on how you feel about it. But what happens when you, go, you feel one way and another person feels another way? You can never come to a resolution because you're functioning on feelings. But when you put facts and data on the table, and you can look at the facts and the data and dollar signs or whatever else you want to do, then you can come to a more informed decision. So we want to understand that everything in God's word is good. Why? Because he is absolutely good. Instead of saying it's not good or I don't like it, just say, you know what, Lord, I don't understand it. Will you give me an understanding in this area? So hopefully we're going to get a more understanding in this. If you just got the understanding today, God is absolutely good. It's going to change your life radically. There's nothing in his word that's bad. Then the angel went and said this, the most joyous news the whole world has ever heard. Now that's a powerful statement. The greatest news the whole world has ever heard. It says, I can't, you know, I don't have time to break all that down right now completely. 
But I do want to say this piece this morning. When God created man, remember back in the garden, God created man. The little guy's okay. He's cool. Relax. It's all good. When God created man, why did he create man? He created him for a purpose. We've got to really get this point. God created man because he wanted a family. God wanted a family. He made the angels. He made other heavenly beings. But he wanted a family. So he created man for that purpose. Sons and daughters that would be just like him. That's why we're made in his image. But the problem was, man messed it up royally because Adam messed up in the garden. And he sinned and he fell. And that caused sin. It caused a break in that relationship. So no longer could he be part of the family. So what makes this announcement so joyous is that God himself is about to fix the problem. What Adam messed up, God is coming to the earth in human form, born of a virgin, and would later die on the cross so that man could be reconciled back to him. God was willing to die to get his family back. Do you get that? Because some people think God is mean, God is harsh, God is angry. No, he was willing to die to get you back because the first man messed it up. He made Adam in his image, blew into him the breath of life. He was in the garden with his wife, messed that up, separated from God. And God said, you know what? There's only one way to make it right. I must come now and be born sinless, live a sinless life and pay that sin debt because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And God said, I'm willing to do that for all of you. Because that's how much I care about. That's how much I want a family to love me and be part with me for all eternity. And then the angel ended with this statement. It is for everyone everywhere. This is a worldwide announcement. No one in the entire world is excluded. God wants all to be part of his family. Which is amazing because you always hear about how Christianity is so exclusive. It blows my mind. No, no, you're exclusive. You know, if you won't believe like you and da-da-da. No, that's all just distraction and, and stupidness from the devil. It's good news to include everybody around the whole world. So next slide, if you would. So after this guy gets done talking, then all of a sudden the sky fills with angels. And they start singing in verse 14, and, and there's a couple pieces I just want to share there. They start singing, and there is peace given to the sons of men. See, God has provided a means of peace. First off, he's provided a means of peace between mankind and himself. For all who will accept Jesus as Lord. And secondly, God has provided a means of peace among mankind. Where mankind can live in peace with each other. Unfortunately, this peace can only take place when you make the Prince of Peace, Jesus, the Lord of your life, and actually follow his principles for living. He's provided this means that, you know, we've had this old mantra for years, you know, can't we all just get along? No, we can't. Not in our natural self. I can't get along with a religion that has declared holy war against me because I'm a Christian and actively want to seek to kill me. See, they don't have the same foundation I have. That's what I'm saying. We need the same foundation because God has made peace between us and himself. That means he's not mad at you. He's not upset at you. He's not angry at you. I don't understand why God gets such a bad rap. You know, why did God send all them tornadoes through Kentucky? He didn't. Why does God get blamed with the bad stuff and never the devil? I mean, we, we, people always do that. It's amazing. No, God is absolutely good. Then why didn't he stop them? Why didn't the Christians stop them? He's given us power and authority upon the earth. Jesus spoke to the weather and calmed the storm. And you always hear testimonies about, you know, people who pray, stand out, rebuke the thing, the house ain't touched, and everything around them is devastated. You know, you see... Uh, pictures of like churches. I saw one church, part of the roof was gone and all the Bibles and everything else were all still in their place. No other damage at all. 
Because we have the authority to collect, declare the word of God to things and see them change. But God's good. God's not mad. He's not upset. And a lot of what we get in our life is what I've shared with you before. We sow and then we reap the harvest. Don't be, don't be mocked. God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he also reap. And I told you before, the older I'm getting, I'm reaping some of that stuff I did in my 20s and 30s. And so that I thought I could get away with back then, and now I'm finding out, no, it actually did have an effect in my life. I remember saying, oh, I can do all this, I can do this, it doesn't bother me at all, see? Well, I was planting a seed, and it just took some time, and now, as my brother said back there this morning, he says, you notice you get a little more stiffer now when you get up in the morning, maybe? <laughs> yeah, especially this kind of weather, when you get a little stormy weather, and, and all of a sudden your knees will start going like that, and you go, oh, a storm's coming. That didn't happen before, you know. So it's a reaping and a sowing that's happened. But I want you to understand, God's created peace. We can live at peace if Jesus is a foundation, and we should one with another. And then the last thing he said was, and a good hope given to the sons of men. God has provided a means of hope. First off, God hopes you will become part of his family. Remember, God will never force nor manipulate you like the devil does in order to get you to do what he desires. See, the Bible says God's not willing that any should perish, but that all will come to repentance. But the reality is people are going to, repent, uh, people are going to perish because they're not going to ask Jesus to be their Lord. Well, that wasn't God's fault. He did everything. So he hopes that you will willingly choose to make that decision because he's not going to put fear in you. That's why it really bothers me. Some preachers are just, I'm going I'm to preach them into hell. Well, people are already going, going there. I want to get them out of there. They're only going because, see, we, we still, even people in the pulpits want to motivate out of fear. No, it's good news. It's awesome news. You can be forgiven of sin. You can have a brand new life. You can walk, walk in the benefits of being born again and have all that stuff in your life for free. Well, the gift is free. It'll cost you as you walk it, though, because you're going to walk contrary to a lot of other people, and you're going to get buffeted a lot. So again, remember, God will never force you and manipulate you like the devil does. He offers the free gift in hopes, in hopes, that you will willfully accept it. And secondly, God hopes that his kids will get along with each other. We were not designed to agree with everything each other believes. Not a lot walk in lockstep with each other. We were designed to cooperate with one another in order to accomplish his agenda so that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth. Why do we think we all got to believe the same, act the same, talk the same, squawk the same? If two of us are doing the same thing, one ain't necessary. You know, that one needs to be doing what they're doing, walking out their divine destiny, walking in that path. You know, it's like plowing a field. You plow your row, the guy next to you is plowing his row, the guy over here is plowing his row, guy down there is plowing his row, he might be planting beans, you're planting celery, and why is he getting upset you're planting celery and not beans? But that's what we do in the church all the time. Well, I don't believe that's right. I'm going elsewhere. Well, I don't think that's true. I'm going out. I, I want to find somewhere where I can be comfortable and believe like everybody else does. Exactly. What's the point? Why are you going to hang out with those you agree with? You're never going to grow. You're never going to mature. You're never going to change. That's why the Bible says iron sharpens iron. You need to get graded a little bit. And not graded in a bad way, but understand when I butt up against someone else who's doing something else and thinking something else, I ought not to attack them and try to force them to believe what I believe. It's like, no, you do your thing. You believe your thing. That's cool. I'm going to stay over here in my lane. You stay in your lane. Let's cooperate and work together and plow the field because it's all for God's honor and glory. Not about us getting the honor and glory. So again, he's brought a hope that we can get along, cooperate with one another because it's his agenda we're trying to bring to earth, not our own. 
So lastly, let's conclude. Next slide, if you would. So what was the shepherd's response? We find that in verse 15. I find this interesting. It says in verse 15, it says this, When the chorus of angels disappeared and returned to heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let's go. Let's hurry and find this word who was born in Bethlehem and see for ourselves what the Lord has revealed to us. So what I find disturbing in the world in which we live is this, how easily so many people believe the words of a complete stranger or believe the words of a person because of the letters before or after their name. Why do we do that? Know what I find funny? And y'all probably do it too. I'm going to not pick on my wife a little bit, but when we search for something and we look for something, we go on Amazon, per se, she says, how many stars does it have? <laughs> you know, what do the reviews say? Oh, yeah, that's it. A lot of good reviews. Let's buy it. We don't know any of those people from Adam. <laughs> we don't know if they're making it up. <laughs> we don't know nothing. But that's what we do, don't we? You know why? Because we're trusting people. That's an okay characteristic. But you've got to understand the enemy's out there wanting to take advantage of people that are trusting like that and sensitive and open. We watch Last Man Standing a lot, you know? And you see Kyle on there. He's got, you know, the softest, sweetest heart, and you just trust everybody. And, you know, Ed goes along and says, that boy needs to get a reality check. <laughs> Not everybody's nice. There's people out there that are willing to take advantage of you. So you got to go to that place. And, and, you know, this is just another thing that really is, is concerning and disturbing. You know, people always use this phrase, well, they said, as if that carries some weight or has authority behind it. Well, they say, well, who the heck are they? I don't know, they. Well, why are you listening to they? You know, and... and and, and, and probably what just puts the icing on the cake for me is this. What I find really disturbing is rarely people ever put in the time and effort to seek out the facts and truth for themselves. In fact, it's been my experience when I've done that research in a matter and shared it with others, I am usually the one that is told wrong, I'm wrong about my analysis because those people say something different. <laughs> well, you can't be right because they said this. You know, and unfortunately, the important part in all this is so many people miss out on the awesome stuff in their life because they never go see and check it out for themselves, just like these shepherds did. What if they said, no, we ain't going? Nah, it's too dark. Hey, that guy was pretty good. I wish he'd come with us. He'd light up the way. But now, we're, you know, no, we're not going to do that. And, that. and that's what people do. We just want to listen to the so-called experts without checking out anything for ourselves. Do you understand it is human nature for people to be selfish and self-centered and not have your best interest at heart? They have their best interest at heart. That's why this stupid thing, putting it on your face, oh, it's not for me, it's for you. No, it ain't. Well, I care about you enough that I don't want to give you something. You got anything? No, I feel great. Then what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, just, you're not even thinking. You know, this is all an emotional thing, and I get it. You're instilled in fear. You allowed this whole situation to instill you with fear. So now you're making irrational decisions based in fear, and you're not searching the thing out for yourself. You've got to do your own research. You've got to do your own digging. You are your own best advocate. You know why? Because whatever you do, you suffer the consequences thereof. Do you understand doctors just practice medicine? Do you understand if they mess up, they don't suffer the consequences of their behavior and actions? I mean, you may sue them, but I told you that a few weeks ago. I used to go in and say, okay, doc, if this was your wife or whatever, what would you do? Well, I'd do this. How do I know he really would have done that? He's there to make money. He's in a business. They don't fault them for that. That's what they do. But again, do you really have the best interests of people at heart? 
No, I ain't going to say that. Yeah, I got to say that, and I got to pick out my own kid. <laughs> I mean, honestly, how many foot surgeries did she go through on the same foot? Honestly. Seriously? Dude, and that dude was going to experience the wrath of Papa Bear if it didn't get fixed this go-around. Because the other dude was going to really feel it. I mean, it wasn't that complicated. But it took somebody who vested time and did a little research on their own to really find out what the issue was to fix it. But the other guy didn't care. Well, I think it's this. Well, I guess it must just be like the other foot, so we'll just do the same thing. Now, again, I'm not pointing fingers and doing that. I'm just trying to really bring about the point, look it, you need to do your own research because it's not a one-size-fits-all. There's not a one-size-fits-all as they're dropping like flies, especially the athletes in foreign countries, on the soccer fields. There's not a one-size-fits-all. Do your own research. Because again, it's about manipulation and control. But see, these guys went to check it out. And that's what concerns me, because we don't check out things, we're missing out on some great and awesome stuff, especially when it comes to the Word of God. And you're going to run into those people. Let me back up a step. I always tell you to check out what I say. Don't just believe me. I've had people for years come up to me and say, preacher so-and-so says this, and you say this, which one's right? I am, of course. <laughs> yeah, but he's that and he says that. You know what that actually is? That's his revelation of what he knows about that in that place. This is my revelation of what we know about in this place. The truth is truth, but your understanding of the truth is your personal revelation, and the Spirit of God wants to give you that so you can walk out your own path and own course in life and be happy, blessed, whole, prosperous, and everything else. Because again, there's not a one size fits all. There's a one truth that fits all. And then there's many facets of that truth. You find out what facet fits for you. And then you take that and you walk that out but it all begins here. It says Christmas is about the greatest gift ever given to mankind. That gift is the opportunity to be adopted into the family of God, along with having access to all the amazing benefits of being part of his family, living a blessed life here on this earth and spending all eternity with God the Father and your brothers and sisters from all over the world. So you may be wondering, how do I receive this gift? You receive it just like you would any other gift. Next Saturday, we're going to be receiving gifts, aren't we? It's very simple. It's not hard. What do you do? First, you've got to accept it. And then you open it. And then you use it for its intended purpose. You know, if you get a shirt, you don't use it as a pair of underwear. You use it as a shirt. You know, you use the gift as your intended purpose. Unless you're my son-in-law. <laughs> was kind of thinking about it. Hey, man, that might be a good idea. I never thought about that. See, he's getting a revelation. A personal revelation. There you go. So again, Romans 10, 9, through 9 and 10. Let me read this to you. So if you believe deep in your heart that God raised Jesus from the pit of death and which your voice and you voice your allegiance by confessing the truth that Jesus is Lord, then you'll be saved. See, that's the accepting part of the gift. And it says, belief in the heart and, lead, and leads to life that is right with God. That's the using of the gift. You know, you believe in your heart, it leads you into a life that's right with God. And then lastly, it says, confession departs from the lips and brings eternal life. That's opening the gift. So it's simple as saying, God, I believe you raised Jesus from the dead. And because you did, I now pledge my allegiance to Jesus and make him my Lord. I ask to be adopted into your family, and I choose to live my life as one of your kids. Amen. It's that simple. So I think that the thing that, I'll just wrap up with this, the thing that really hit me in that was that God was willing for himself to come and make it right. Because he wants a family. That's how badly he wants a family. 
He came to make it right. He said, I made a family. Devil got in there, messed with them. He screwed up. He fell. Okay, now I got to fix that. And he came himself, born of a virgin. And we know the Christmas story. And then they went to the inn. Angels showed up and told the shepherds. That's what's pretty cool. That the, the, the angels didn't go to the political leaders. Didn't even go to the religious leaders. Went to the everyday Joe. The working guy who's out in the field just making a living. Because that's who God wants. God wants everybody. But we always think, nah, I'm not good enough. Nah, who would want me? You know... My family didn't even want me. Man, I've always been put down and told them nothing my whole life. You're the exact person God wants. He wants some other folk too. But I just thought it was interesting. He went to them. And though it was great, they went to check it out. Because do you know who the first spreaders of the gospel were? These guys were. Because it said Mary took everything and pondered it in her heart. And then if you continue to read, these guys went out and spread the good news of what they heard and what they saw. Because again, that's what God wants to use, the everyday guy, to spread the word that Jesus has come and you can be reconciled with him and you can have a home in heaven for all eternity, but also live on this life blessed, encouraged, filled, Nothing missing, nothing broken. No matter what's going on in your life, you can go to bed at night, pillow your head, and get a great night's sleep. No matter what distractions you face the next day, you don't have to fear. Because you know God's got it. All you got to do is say, God, how do I get through this situation? You're going to walk through. But that's the key. You're going through. He says, I've made you more than overcomers. I don't know how that works. That don't compute here. You overcome, you overcome. But more than overcomers? That's pretty cool. That's like water walking talk. Man. And then when people see you overcoming, you can just say, it ain't me. Him working through me. What you're seeing in my life that's maybe you like and is attracting you, it's not me. It's him. You wouldn't have liked the guy that I used to be. Amen. You wouldn't. And it's a good thing he's dead. Because if he wasn't dead, he literally would be dead now, probably. The way I was living and the way I was going. Because I would have been sowing all those seeds now for over 60 years. And a crop would probably be coming in. So it's a good thing that guy died. But now, because he's dead, Christ can live in me. And now I can display that to the world. To be adopted into God's family is an awesome thing. He paid all the price for it, made out all the paperwork, and just said, here's a gift. Open it up and receive it and use it. And you'll be blessed. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Lord, I do thank you for the simplicity of your word. That you don't make it hard, you don't make it deep. You came, gave the message, and you left it up to the shepherds to check it out. So, Father, my prayer this morning is people will check it out, and they'll go see for themselves. That you'd stir up the desire in their hearts to want to be adopted into your family. And then get all the benefits that come along with it. And it's as simple as what we just said at the end. That's how we receive in the Spirit. Just like on Christmas morning when we receive the gift and that loved one comes and is all excited to see you open it and, and you open it and they see your excitement and it's just an awesome time. That, that's what you want too, Lord. You're just waiting there with the gift in hand, holding it out, hoping and anticipating and with excitement, saying this is the greatest gift ever given. Can't be matched by anything else. So, Lord, I pray this Christmas there'll be many that will take the gift from your hand, many that will open it, and many that will use it. They won't abuse it, won't use it wrongly, 
but use it for your honor and glory and that your family would multiply exponentially this year, Lord. Because, Father, that was your desire when you made man to create a family that you could enjoy and, and we could enjoy you. So, Father, by your spirit, stir and challenge and courage. But most of all, Lord, may we see that family glow, grow as we close out this crazy year we've had of 2020, Lord. May it go out with a bang, so to speak, with the family growing. And we thank you for our time now together. Bless it as we have time of fellowship. And we thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Be blessed and have some cake.